Good day. Your shirt fine? Ah, uh, no. No? Two Monty? young constables uh, flip a coin yeah, to decide who will cross yeah. the road to the Russell Street Police oh, Canteen yeah. to buy the lunches. I pick tails. Tails? Neither would know how high the stakes would be. The Russell Street bombing rocked the foundations of a city, its residents and police force to the very core. But a 100-strong team of detectives, bomb and forensic experts were determined from day one that the culprits would not get away with it. I was heading to get some lunch from the Russell Street complex when it uh, went off. I was thrown into the air probably about 20 metres and landed on the, uh, on the road and uh, laying flat on my back. I actually thought initially I'd been hit by a car. My right leg was pretty badly damaged, so I just uh, dragged that along the road to the wall of Russell Street. Russell Street 150, um, we just had a large explosion occur outside the building. Car bomb, it seems, um, shattered all the windows at this office, received. All of a sudden, the building shook. There was a horrendous sound. There was uh, a lot of black dust, very fine dust, coming out of the uh, wooden roof. The place just turned black. Glass came across my desk. I got up. Had a look outside the broken windows, and there was this huge pour of black smoke going up the front. It was just obvious what had happened. There's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that it was a bomb. Russell 150 from the uh, ranking fire officer. He believes it is a device, it is not gas. Big bang, windows started to crack, and, and off we went. That was the start of it all. And I just said, look, I'll get the bomb suit and let's go. And the whole feeling is that there's another bomb. 150, Roger. Bomb disposal people uh, have been sighted. The first bang is not the last bang. It's what I got taught by the military guys in Northern Ireland. The first bang was to suck you in, and the second bang was when it killed you. From Air 490, two cars were involved, one outside the north door, one outside the south door. The one outside the south door was suspected of holding the second bomb. And I start to walk down Russell Street towards the car. I had a rope round my waist so that if anything does happen to me, that he's got the rope to pull me back. You then see things on the road. I can see bits of explosion, detonators and whatever. And you know, well, if you stand on one of those detonators, it's a good chance you'll lose your foot. It looked like a war zone. I came around into the quadrangle of the old Melbourne Magistrates Court and saw this sight that you'll never forget. Her shoe was on fire. Her shirt was in tatters. Every time her heart beat, you'd see blood coming out of her. You could see skin hanging off her hands. I asked her her name. She said her name was Angela. 22-year-old Angela Taylor lost the toss. Seconds before 1pm, she left the court building to buy lunch at the Russell Street Police Complex. I sat her down on the floor in the office. She was obviously visibly in pain and shocked and disorientated. I made some calls, so I was able to get her some help. Magistrate West was out the front and he was injured as well. Donadio, 
over the road. Got to the wall and then there was a couple of other police members that came and helped me at that stage and uh, they walked me up to the steps of the north door and laid me down there and there's still a couple of small explosions. There's been a second explosion unit, stay away from the area. Initially I wondered whether it was a series of explosions but it was obvious after a couple of minutes that the small explosions were detonators and were primed and activated. Meanwhile, Dennis Tipping had reached the second car that was parked behind the one that had exploded. The firemen didn't want to do it, and it's not their job any here, because it was jolly and all other stuff there. And if there is a bomb, then you have to start pulling it apart. So I put the fire out, and thankfully there wasn't another bomb and it turned out to be an undercover police car. After 40 minutes, the fires were extinguished, the city sealed off, and 21 people, including the severely injured constables Taylor and Donadio, were in hospital. Good evening. Terrorism hit Melbourne today. Bomb after bomb exploded outside the city's police headquarters, injuring dozens and causing extensive damage. Buildings from Burke Street to Queensbury Street were evacuated. Shops closed and by 2.30, many city streets were deserted. What's happened this afternoon puts us right in the forefront of terrorism, as we've seen in other parts of the world. And it's disturbing that we've got cowardly people that could only be described as curs that are prepared to impose this sort of violence on the community with little regard for life or property. There was no doubt whatsoever in my mind that it was a, an attack on the police force and on authority in general, and it worked. Police are checking the list of people who were to appear in the Melbourne Magistrates Court opposite the police station. But no individual or group has yet claimed responsibility. What is certain is that such an attack against the police force itself will result in an investigation for the culprits as thorough and widespread as Victoria has ever seen. The thin blue line gathers together. All you want to do is find out who is it, where are they, and let's go and get them. A car bomb had exploded outside the Russell Street Police Complex. 21 people were injured. Constable Angela Taylor was fighting for her life. The clue as to who was responsible lay in the debris that had scattered over several city blocks. And with the danger of live ammunition, the Special Operations Group were moved in. And we became the brushes and dustbins and, and the finders of evidence. I think from memory, we were there for nearly five days. We're now on the third floor at the canteen. We found detonators inside Russell Street. We found a live detonator in the ladies' gymnasium up on the uh, fourth floor. Some members of the Special Operations Group abseiled down the complex searching for further clues, while others were on their hands and knees picking debris from the bitumen. They found a tyre, I think, and a wheel from the bomb car in the car park at the back of Russell Street. So it's literally flown over Russell Street, over the building at the back of Russell Street in the car park. Every piece was important. Like a large jigsaw puzzle, each piece of debris would give the forensic team a picture of what had gone on. It's important to collect all the debris because we need to reconstruct what took place. We were able to identify that the bomb car actually uh, ended up several metres away from the actual seat of the explosion because there was a crater in the roadway and the bomb car was uh, several metres further to the east. And as you can see, it's approximately 15 centimetres deep at its deepest point. And the width is of the order of one and a half metres. When we started to look at the, uh, the bomb car, 
Most of the damage was done to the rear of the vehicle, which it seemed to indicate that the bomb had been placed in the boot of the vehicle. That's where the tow bar's gone in, and that's just forward of it where the diff would be, and that's north of differential oil on one side and explosive on the other. So it's got to be that way. So the disc might then explosive has been just over the diff in front of the diff. On further examination, we were able to identify that there was a secondary explosion between the front seats or on the centre console. The secondary explosion had been disrupted by the first one being the larger one in the boot. And this was identified by the amount of live detonators and a number of uh, sticks of gelling knife were located forward of the vehicle and hadn't exploded. You wonder what would have happened if all of it had gone off. It might have brought down part of the building. A huge amount of electrical wire still bound in bundles were also found around the car. So too, the ignition device. And I was sitting on the steps playing with the explosives and I just looked across to my left and there was this piece of wood with this clock sitting on it. And that was it. You know when you see that, you put two and two together, yet yeah, it's a clock bomb. This block of wood looked fairly common and represented a part of a fence post. Attached to this block of wood, there were also pieces of metal and there was a chuck's wipe as well. The chuck's wipe was obviously used as a buffer between the ignition components of the timing device to prevent the device from triggering. Whoever moved the bomb in the vehicle uh, took enormous risks in transporting it the way they did to uh, Russell Street. Any slight bump could have triggered the device. While the block of wood had distinctive tool markings, finding the fence it came from would be like finding a needle in a haystack. So the detectives were grateful that a more tangible clue had survived the bomb. The number plate was still in the vicinity of the vehicle and that enabled us to very quickly identify who the owner of the vehicle was and we found out that it had been stolen some week or so before the bombing. Police say the main blast was caused by 50 sticks of gelignite in the boot of a stolen 1979 two-tone brown and fawn Commodore parked outside the Russell Street Police building. It had distinctive gold mag wheels and a loud twin exhaust. Today, the lookalike car was taken to Russell Street in the hope of jolting memories. Police also displayed a travel rug found within the bomb car. Detectives say the rug doesn't belong to the owner of the stolen car, and although it has no label, it could help with investigations. It was in fairly good condition considering the blast, and it was determined that the actual blanket was covering the ignition device. The blanket was examined and there were a number of dog hairs located on the blanket. The dog hairs were short in nature and probably from a uh, terrier type dog. Police received 20 calls overnight and are encouraged by the response. They'll be sifting through the new information today to see just how useful it is. Several days after the Russell Street bombing, a person contacted the Chief Commissioner of Police, Mick Miller, and uh, stated he actually had footage of whoever was responsible for the Russell Street bombing, and he also demanded half a million dollars for that information. In fact, the caller rang five times. Each call traced to various phone boxes in the suburb of St Kilda. And then he stopped. We initially thought he was most probably a crank, but you can't ignore things like that. Premier John Kane and Chief Commissioner Mick Miller jointly announced the record half million dollars reward. But in a press conference, they refused to answer any questions on developments behind their decision. The offer of an amount of this magnitude might succeed in producing vital information. And I don't propose to divulge the nature of that information in case it might jeopardise this development. It was a tactical move. 
The anonymous caller was either legitimate and the case would be solved or it was a hoax. Either way, detectives believed he would make contact again and with few leads so far, they were counting on it. It was now three weeks since the bombing and 22-year-old Angela Taylor, who had graduated ducks of her year, was still in hospital in a critical condition. Police hoped that an anonymous caller they were trying to draw out by offering a reward would lead them to those responsible for the attack. It was a full operation, involved police from all around Melbourne. We staked out telephone boxes in a rather large area of St Kilda and Elwood. He again contacted the Chief Commissioner and he was actually arrested in a phone box by a detective from St Kilda. Vladimir Richter, a 38-year-old industrial chemist, was arrested yesterday while he was actually calling police from a public phone box. Police told the court that Richter's false information on the Russell Street bombing had hindered the investigation, wasting police man hours and manpower. With one lead down, another came up. This black and white photo fit was compiled from information supplied by a witness who claimed to have seen the man park the car outside Russell Street at about 12.30 on the day. This identity kit photograph looked very similar to a low-level criminal by the name of Claudio Krupe. And information came to hand from potential witnesses that on the day of the bombing, Krupe was seen wrapping up what was believed to be gel ignite. He had a particular dislike for a detective at the Major Crime Squad, and he was certainly known to be capable of violence. We conducted a number of search warrants in an effort to locate Claudio Krupe. Um, all were unsuccessful. He left Melbourne very quickly and he was avoiding apprehension, so of course um, he became the major focus of the investigation. As police searched for this prime suspect, a separate and unrelated inquiry had brought two officers from the stolen motor vehicle squad to the police compound where the bomb car was located. Approximately three weeks before the Russell Street bombing, a stolen red Daimler sedan was pursued by traffic police. The car crashed and the driver escaped. We got contacted by St Albans CIB to come out because in the boot of that red Daimler was a bag containing cut up pieces of number plates. And they were identified as belonging to a stolen silver Brock special. So I put a notification on our police database that if the vehicle was ever found, then I was to be contacted immediately. And that's what happened. Whilst we were waiting for the delivery of the Brock Commodore to come out to our compound so we could examine that, we actually uh, sticky nose a little bit and uh, walked over and had a look at the Russell Street bomb car. And when we looked at the vehicle, we noticed that the chassis number had been drilled out. Normally what would happen is they would use an angle grinder to drill it. It takes longer time to cut them out, so that's unusual. We'd never seen that method before. I mean, for someone to drill the chassis number out is, in our opinion, strange. Meanwhile, the police had caught up with Claudio Krupe. 29-year-old Claudio David Krupe was taken before Chief Stipendiary Magistrate John Dugan. His counsel said his client was not only willing to be questioned, but also agreed to take part in a lineup. He said Krupe denied his participation in the bombing. Krupe is now back in the Russell Street Police Complex, the scene of the bombing almost three weeks ago, and is still being questioned. Out at the police compound, the stolen Commodore had arrived. The investigation into the bombing of the Russell Street complex was to take another turn and, as a result, give police another suspect. When the Silverbrock Commodore Special came in, when we lifted the bonnet, we also noticed that the chassis number on that vehicle had been drilled out. And it was the identical method that was used on the other vehicle that was sitting in the compound, virtually 50 feet from it. So, to see two vehicles with the chassis number drilled out was, in our opinion, extremely unique. And it occurred to me that the offender involved in the Brock Special and the Daimler 
may well have been involved in the Russell Street bombing. The squad now looked back at the incident three weeks before the bombing and the identification of the driver who had crashed the Daimler. The offender in the vehicle fled the area. He ran around a couple of blocks and then intercepted a motorist actually driving past. But the police officer who had been chasing the Daimler had caught sight of him. He was showing a series of photographs and identified a person known as Peter Reed. Peter Reed was known to the motor vehicle squad in relation to other offences. He was currently being investigated and members of his family were being investigated in relation to stolen motor vehicles. The suspicion was that Peter Reed had been involved in what's known as rebirthing. Rebirthing is where someone buys a wreck, they steal a similar car, they put the wreck's identification onto the stolen car and re-register the stolen car as a new car. When we observed the Russell Street bomb car with the drill outs on it, and then we seen the other vehicle, uh, it was virtually a complete match. So we had two cars from allegedly two different sources and they had the identical modus operandi. Peter Reed was seemingly connected to both these cars. But did that make Reed the Russell Street bomber? Or now, the murderer? More than 1,000 people gathered at the Glen Waverley Police Academy to pay tribute to the young policewoman variously described as vibrant, brilliant and forthright. Mourners included bomb victims Magistrate Ian West and Constable Carl Donadio. It was pretty upsetting. I recall the funeral pretty vividly. But it was good to go there and pay my respects to Angela. Outside the chapel, 500 police and emergency services personnel lined the route as the cortege made its way to the Springvale Crematorium for a private cremation. There is a destiny that makes us brothers. None goes this way alone. We were determined at the start that we were going to see it through to the finish, and her death just strengthened that resolve, I think it's fair to say. The police had two lines of inquiry. The first was a clear favourite. Claudio Krupe had been seen making a bomb on the very morning Russell Street had been targeted. Lord Krupe was still the major focus of the investigation. The Silverbrock special line of inquiry was probably the second strongest line of inquiry we were following. The Silverbrock inquiry involved suspected car rebirther Peter Reed. But what flagged him as a person of interest in the Russell Street bombing was the fact that the Silverbrock Commodore had identical drill outs to those found in the bomb car. At the time we discovered the involvement and passed the information onto the Russell Street Bomb Task Force. We also became aware that the armed robbery squad were also investigating Peter Reid in relation to a number of offences. Peter Reid was a person of particular interest to the armed robbery squad in relation to the investigation into a number of particularly violent armed robberies on banks. In fact, that silver Commodore had been allegedly sighted crashing into a bank where a hold-up had taken place on the afternoon of the bombing. And we combined forces at that time and surveillance was undertaken of Peter Reid. As a consequence of this, a series of raids were conducted on the 25th of April, Anzac Day. The purpose of the raid was to find evidence in relation to stolen cars and any evidence that we may have found in relation to um, robberies that they may have been involved in and whether or not there might have been some evidence to indicate their involvement in the Russell Street bombing. A number of the crew went to a bedroom on my right. I went to the bedroom on the left with Mark Wiley. I turned on the light. On the far wall was a complete window, which when you turn the light on, turned into a mirror. And you can actually see Peter Reed on the bed in his underwear. I've moved in and sort of gone around to get vision at the edge of the door. 
He was in a combat position and he had a 45 caliber revolver in his hand and he was pointing it directly at me. That area is called the tunnel of death when you're doing raids. You're not sure where they are, but they know where you are. And I then turned around and said, Peter, it's John Bradbury from the Stolen Motor Vehicle Squad. Put the gun down. Now, Reed's response to that negotiation was to simply fire two shots back towards me. When he fired the first couple of shots, I realised that he was obviously determined to fight it out with the police. Now, those two shots just went straight past my nose. Using the glass as a mirror, I fired two shots out of the pump action shotgun through the doorway. They went through the bedroom door and they were directed at him. I was reloading for the third shot and I jammed the shotgun. I looked up and Reed was not in the position where I last saw him in the glass. I then decided to enter the bedroom to confront him. As soon as he saw that barrel come past the edge of the doorway, he fired the next two shots. When people fire at you, everything seems to be in slow motion at the time. You can see the flashes of the gun. And although it's in a split second, it appears that it's been going on for about a minute. Clearly, I knew that I'd been shot. Um, it's just like getting hit by a truck. Reed jumped off the bed, came around from the window side, and immediately pointed the firearm at me. He fired two shots directly at me, and I returned fire with two shots. I noticed that he dropped to the ground. I kicked the gun out of his hand. We then handcuffed him. I had a ski parker on with an elasticised waist, and um, the bullet had gone straight through my body, but when I unzipped the elasticised waist of the parker, the slug fell on the ground, and <laughs> I said to one of the detectives, I said, just mark that, because we've got the crime scene here now, and I'm still in charge. Well, after the shooting incident, we uh, got the forensic science people out to Reed's address. We found quite a large amount of evidence. A Magnum 45 was found in the bedroom where the shooting had taken place. There were a number of firearms that were located in the lounge room, and we identified that the serial numbers had been drilled out. And these were consistent with similarities on the bomb car chassis number and also on the silver Brock Commodore. Among other items that we collected from the lounge room were scanners. Their serial numbers had also been removed. And on the floor was a uh, canvas haversack. And sitting on top of the haversack were two detonators. Naturally, our thoughts were, well, these detonators look very similar to those that were used in the Russell Street bombing. Inside the haversack, they found four neatly wrapped packages. On removing the newspaper, the contents were sticks of gelling knife, the same or similar to what was used in the Russell Street bombing. So we were certainly on the right track in regard to identifying the suspects for the Russell Street bombing. That we were unable to find any building or fence line that fitted the block of wood that was located at the bomb scene. During the course of the surveillance on Peter Reid, surveillance had observed him going to an address in Harris Avenue, Nutterwadding, on a number of occasions. And so that address was simultaneously raided by the various squads. There was nothing really to connect that address to the bombing, apart from the fact that Peter Reid used to associate with it. The occupant of the house was Carl Zelenka. He had no criminal history. A couple of us spoke to Carl over a period of a couple of hours, and we asked him if he knew Peter Reid, and he denied it. And we knew that wasn't true, so we knew that Carl was keeping that from us. It was also obvious to us that he was carrying a rather heavy burden. And of course, what we had to do then was find out what it actually was that he knew that he wasn't being forthcoming with. 
28-year-old Peter Reid of Callista was released from hospital today and appeared at a preliminary hearing at the city watch house. He was charged with two counts of attempted murder as well as seven other charges including armed robbery. When the fingerprint section dusted Peter Reid's house, they found a couple of pertinent prints. An identified fingerprint which was located on the Albury Border Morning Mail, which was wrapped around a number of sticks of explosives, was identified as belonging to Rodney Minot, who had some criminal convictions. Also significance was another fingerprint, which was found on the toilet door, and that fingerprint was identified as belonging to Rodney's brother, Craig Minogue. They were fundamentally small-time criminals. And my personal feeling was that they were a part of the major jigsaw. There was no doubt. We ascertained Rodney and Peter Reid, in fact, served time in a prison together. So, of course, we endeavoured to locate the Minogue brothers and were unable to find them. They'd left Melbourne shortly after the Russell Street bombing and hadn't been seen since. Why had they done that? When the task force checked Craig Minogue's file, there was an entry about a car picking him up outside a court. That car was registered to Carl Zelenka. Carl Zelenka was the occupant of the house where Peter Reid had been seen visiting. He had denied knowing Reid, and that stance continued for the Minogue brothers. We knew that Zelenka knew Craig and Rodney Minogue because we showed photographs of the Minogues to neighbours and they identified them as associating at that address. But what we didn't know was why he wasn't telling us that he knew them. Back at the forensic laboratory, the detonators from Reed's house and the bomb scene were being compared. The cutting of the wires on the detonators were consistent with the cutting of wires located on detonators in the Russell Street bombing. Obviously, there were implements that have been used to make the cuts on these wires. So if we're able to identify those implements, we would then be able to say that these cutters made those cuts. What had been identified was the origin of the metal bar that had been nailed to the block of wood found at the bomb scene. Our bomb expert was uh, actually lying home in bed one night and it dawned on him that the metal strip to complete the circuit between the timing device and the explosives may have been the handle from that metal rubbish bin. Now, when we looked closer at Carl Zelenka's rubbish bin, we noticed the lid was missing. And there'd been a couple of attempts to cut the handles of that rubbish bin, as though someone had had a practice shot at cutting the handles off. When we asked Carl where the lid was, he was very vague and wasn't very forthcoming as to where he thought the lid was. As a matter of course, each premises that we went to, we would also look to see if we could identify some uh, red gum posts that uh, could be married to the block of wood that was located at Russell Street. When they had first looked at the property, there was little joy. But on a subsequent visit, the bomb expert looked over the neighbouring fence. Bob Barnes jumped a neighbour's fence and he disappeared under a camellia bush. I can still hear his chuckle to this very day. He placed the bomb block of wood on top of that fence post. There was an identical fault line running through the timber and it fitted beautifully. And we knew then that we'd found the post that the bomb block had come off. That discovery was probably one of the best ones I've made in my career and we were actually ecstatic that, that we'd located that post. It was very important to us. From that point on, the task force really regarded that address as being the bomb headquarters, where the bomb was most probably put together. You say your mates, but Carl Zelenka became a vital person to us, and we took him back to the office, and myself and one of the other detectives on the task force had a pretty serious talk to him, and um, I laid out everything in front of him that we knew about him his lies, you know, the block of wood, his rubbish bin, lying about knowing the Minogue brothers and Peter Reid. And we actually told him, like, you know, you look at it from our point of view, what would you think? And uh, he knew that he was in it up to his neck. He said, I'll tell you everything I know, 
but I want you to guarantee my safety and that of my family and my girlfriend. Cal told us that Craig Minogue and Rodney Minogue were living at the house and that Peter Reid used to come to the address. On the Tuesday preceding the Russell Street bombing, he saw this very clean, tidy, distinguishable Commodore sedan drive into the garage. It was a two-tone brown fawn coloured vehicle, had beautiful mag wheels, and of course was identical to the vehicle which had been blown up outside Russell Street. On another occasion, he'd had cause to go to the garage where he identified what appeared to be a box of explosives. He confronted Craig Minogue about that. Craig said to him, forget what you saw, you didn't see anything. Craig Minogue had paid for Carl and his girlfriend to fly to Sydney for Easter while the bombing took place. When he returned, the brothers were moving out. And he was instructed to get rid of the lid of his rubbish bin. It was tossed on the back of the trailer, which was going down the tip. As a result of Carl's statement, Peter Reid was charged with the murder of Angela Taylor. But there was still a question, where were the Minogues? Carl Zelenka told us that the Minogue brothers and Peter Reid were visited by a fellow approximately 50 years of age. Carl only knew him as Stan the Man and that he lived in the country. With a description from Carl Zelenka and a check through the criminal records for aliases, the task force identified Stanley Brian Taylor. This man was a most violent and vicious criminal. His prior convictions dated back to stealing fish in 1949 at the age of 12. And much of his adult life had been spent in jail. In the late 70s, he was released from prison and to all intent and purpose had reformed himself. His occupation was being a mentor to people who'd been involved in crime giving them guidance to avoid a life of crime such as Stan himself had, had experienced. Was this the case? Had Stan the man gone to the bomb house to guide the Minogue brothers and Reed against a life of crime? Or was he there to lend his knowledge? It was obvious this man would never change. His ilk do not change. Pressure was on the detectives to find the three outstanding suspects believed to be involved in the bombing of Russell Street and the murder of Angela Taylor. We established that Craig and Rodney Minogue had bought a house in Birchip and that they were living not far from Stan Taylor. The houses were raided. Stan Taylor was arrested. Good old Stan, he uh, put his hands in the air and told us that he knew that Craig and Rodney had blown up Russell Street. It didn't surprise me at all. Stanley Taylor is what can be commonly referred to as an old lag. You say nothing that will identify cohorts publicly, but privately you do whatever deal you can with the police in order to protect your own skin. Stan is a typical coward. When the pressure was on, he, uh, he folded up very quickly. When we went to the uh, Minogue's address, they weren't home. And uh, Stan kindly uh, volunteered us the uh, name of the motel they were staying at. This morning, the Special Operations Group raided the motel at Swan Hill. There, they found two men who were questioned for some hours. One of them, 23-year-old Craig Minogue, appeared in Swan Hill Court a short time ago. He was charged with nine offences, among them the murder of Angela Taylor and the attempted murders of Constable Bernardio and Magistrate West. The man's 20-year-old brother is still being questioned. While the brothers were in custody, their house was being forensically examined. A number of items were located. There were firearms and there was a high-speed engraving unit. Also at that address was a terrier-type dog. The hairs that were collected from the terrier were consistent in size and colour to the hairs that were located on the blanket collected at uh, the Russell Street bombing. Back at the laboratory, I used the engraving burr to 
to drill into old firearms. And then casting the base of the actual engraving burr, I was able to conclude that the patterning of all of the serial numbers that have been drilled out were consistent. And that consistency extended to the bomb car and also that of the silver Brock Commodore. In my mind, the evidence indicated that the firearms were linked to the engraving burr and ultimately linked to the Russell Street bombing. Further evidence was seized from a lockup rented by the Minogue brothers. Along with an explosives handbook and detonators, there were tools that were of particular interest. There was a pair of blue-handled tin snips. These were used to create test cut impressions on similar types of wires to those of the detonators to determine whether those cut wires were consistent with the cut wires from uh, Russell Street bombing. They were. The detonator wires from Peter Reed's house, those in the Minogue lockup, and at the bomb site all had consistent tool mark impressions. Craig Minogue sat in the interview room with a half smile on his face and basically told us his name and address and remained mute from that point onwards. But his younger brother Rodney was a different story. He rang his mother and it was after that that he made pretty full and frank disclosures of his involvement and what he knew of the Russell Street bombing and basically it was orchestrated and planned predominantly by Stan Taylor. Stan had claimed to the detectives that he was there the morning of the bombing, but had nothing to do with it. We believe Rodney's version, not Stan's. Other witnesses corroborated that fact. One was a good mate of Stan Taylor's. In a deal made where he became a protected witness, he told police that Taylor was well and truly involved. Stan had an inseparable friend at Birch, Paul Kurt Hetzel, and uh, he put the finishing touches to what had happened. Like He'd been involved in a fair degree of the lead up to the bombing. He was present when a group of them broke into a, a mine in the country and stole a quantity of jelly night to use in the bombing. Charged with murder and intention to cause serious injury arising out of the Russell Street bombing two years ago are Stanley Taylor, Peter Reed, Craig Minogue and his brother Rodney. All four have pleaded not guilty. The relief of getting the four to trial was enormous. I remember we pulled up outside the St Kilda Road Police Complex and we met a couple of young police officers that we'd never met before and, uh, the, and the emotion that, that they showed sort of indicated to you that what we'd actually done because, yeah, she was a friend. Paul Hetzel told the court that after the mine burglary, Stan Taylor and Craig Minogue had tested the stolen detonators on a country property. And later, Craig Minogue had said that he, Taylor and Reed were definitely going to blow up Russell Street headquarters. The evidence presented at the trial indicated that the bomb car was driven to Russell Street by Craig Minogue and Peter Reed, and Stan Taylor followed in the Silver Brock special. The car was then parked outside the southern door of the Russell Street police complex. The chuck swipe removed and the bomb was set. When Hetzel was interviewed, he told us that they waited for the bomb to go off. When one o'clock arrived, they were a little bit concerned that they may not have said it correctly. When it eventually detonated, there was a, a fair degree of, of joy in the car. So we were quietly confident we had sufficient evidence to convict the main players in it. Stanley Taylor, Peter Reed, Craig Minogue and his brother Rodney arrived at the Supreme Court again this morning to await verdict, but not before letting their feelings known as they entered the court. Innocent! Innocent! I'm innocent! I'm 
I actually remember the day the, the verdict was handed down, um, I was physically sick. And um, it was a, yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of tension. The jury found Stanley Taylor and Craig Minogue both guilty of the murder of Constable Angela Taylor, guilty of causing serious injury to Constable Carl Donadio and Magistrate Ian West, and guilty of several other serious charges. So I thought, now you know that you're going to pay for what you did. Stan Taylor received a life sentence, never to be released. Craig Minogue also received a life sentence with a minimum of 28 years. His brother's conviction of accessory after the fact was quashed at an appeal. Justice Frank Vincent retired the jury until tomorrow morning, which is still deliberating on Peter Reed in relation to charges involving his arrest at Callista. I did do it! Can you understand? The following day after the verdicts on Taylor and the Minogue brothers, the jury returned with a verdict on Peter Reed. Today, the jury found Peter Reed guilty of the attempted murder of policeman Stephen Quincy during a police raid on Reed's Callista home a month after the bombing. And guilty of recklessly causing serious injury to policeman Mark Wiley in the same raid. However, the jury found him not guilty on all major charges arising out of the bombing, including the murder of 22-year-old Constable Angela Taylor. It was the only jury verdict I've wept over in 31 years in the police halls. What can you say? You know, it was, we were disappointed, very disappointed, and um, still disappointed. After serving nine years, Peter Reid was released from jail in 1995.